our genes directs us from behind the scenes the words within it shape life's destiny hidden in your dna is your genetic dossier it tells your future and your history how traits can pass from parents to a child is something that has kept us so beguiled cracking the code Genetic mysteries to unfold Cracking the code Genetic secrets will be told Cracking the code Genetic mysteries to unfold Cracking the code Genetic secrets will be told Cracking the code In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the double helix structure of DNA. The pairing of complementary bases A with T and C with G immediately suggested how chromosomes might replicate themselves, the essence of heredity. Watson and Crick also theorized that a mutation or genetic change is the result of one base transforming into another say C into T. This mutation would then replicate itself through the base pairing rules. The double helix also opened the door to the other great secrets of the chromosomes. How they store information and how this information is used to control the processes of life and to create the most complex of living creatures. Sidney Brenner, then age 26 and a scientist at Oxford, drove over to Cambridge to look at Watson and Crick's model of DNA. He saw right away that it would revolutionize biology. What we were dealing with now is, a new, is the chemistry of information, of biological information. This information is stored within long strings of letters representing the four different bases within the double helix. And these letters must somehow lead to the production of proteins. Proteins are also long strings of component parts, the 20 different amino acids. But unlike the linear strings of DNA, proteins get folded into unique three-dimensional shapes. And it is that three-dimensional structure that allows it to execute its particular kind of function. So in a sense, a, a protein is like a machine. A protein is like a car or a protein is like a lawnmower. Each of these three-dimensional machines carry out different functions and so it is with protein. Early on, it seemed clear that the linear sequence of bases in a gene must somehow dictate the linear sequence of amino acids in a protein. And I personally thought that this this was the, the key problem. How do you get from that sequence of bases to the sequence of amino acids? In 1957, Francis Crick teamed up with a new scientific partner, Sidney Brenner. Their challenge was to find out how genes produce proteins. They actually had two information problems to solve. The first one was transportation. Chromosomes are locked within the nucleus, while proteins are manufactured in the cytoplasm of the cell in structures called ribosomes. What carries genetic information from chromosome to ribosome? The second problem was interpretation. How does this message get translated from the language of DNA into the language of protein? Attention now focused on RNA, a molecule that might hold the answer to both problems. A single-stranded relative of DNA, it is found in both nucleus and cytoplasm, but more so in the cytoplasm. It was also known that RNA is involved in protein synthesis. So it was a good candidate to be the transportation agent from chromosome to ribosome. And it was also possible that RNA could act as the dictionary that translates the language of DNA into the language of protein. In the first years after the publication of the model for DNA, there was already a group of uh, scientists who had formed what they called the RNA tie club. 
The RNA tie club was founded by a well-known physicist, George Gamov, who was intrigued by the double helix structure. There were 20 members, one for each amino acid. The last two members were Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner. Francis was tyrosine and I was valine. So I just got in at number 20. It was regarded as a very fringe group, in my opinion, by, you know, the kind of establishment science. They speculated that genetic information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. Crick later termed this theory the central dogma. Central he chose dogma. the word dogma because there was still no experimental evidence to back it up. I think I was the original proponent of the, what is now called the central dogma of DNA to RNA to protein. I sort of, fortunately I wrote it down on paper. I had taped it up on my desk at the time. When I became a graduate student, Watson had pinned to his, uh, uh, pasted to his table lamp a little sign saying DNA, arrow, RNA, arrow, protein. So that model had been formed. What Crick contributed was the idea that once genetic information passes into protein, it is trapped. It cannot flow backwards. The first step in the central dogma from DNA to what was now called messenger RNA is termed transcription. The four bases in RNA are almost identical to those in DNA, with U substituting for T. RNA bases can pair up with complementary DNA bases in the same way that DNA bases pair up within the double helix. If somehow the DNA double helix was able to unwind and separate, it seemed plausible that one of its single strands could serve as a template or mold upon which a complementary strand of RNA could form. This theory also preceded any sort of experimental evidence. Such was the power of the base pairing idea that in fact you'd, we always used to say, well, there'll be an enzyme to do this. Leslie Orgel said there'll be an enzyme to unwind it. Don't worry, you see. The next step from messenger RNA to protein is called translation. For Crick and Brenner, this was a much tougher puzzle to solve. Many of their best discussions took place at the same Cambridge pub that Crick and Watson had once frequented. We used to write things on the beer mats. Someone came to explain their theory and turned over a beer mat and found it written out there already for them. That story I think Francis tells. But there were many, there were many interesting discussions. The first problem they tackled was how the four different bases in RNA could code for the 20 different amino acids in proteins. Clearly, the RNA coding unit could not be a single base. A single base has only four possibilities. Suppose the coding unit is two letters long. Since there are four possible letters in each position, there are four times four or 16 possible combinations still not enough to code for 20 amino acids. A three-letter coding unit would allow for 64 different combinations, which was more than enough. So the coding unit was probably three letters long. In 1961, Brenner and Crick did a series of experiments with bacterial viruses, which proved conclusively that the DNA coding unit was indeed three letters long. Brenner termed it the codon. The next problem they tackled was how messenger RNA codons pair up with their corresponding amino acids. Perhaps each codon served as a template onto which its amino acid would fit, but that didn't make sense chemically. Crick was the first to realize there had to be an intermediate molecule between a messenger RNA codon and an amino acid, which he called the adapter plus an enzyme to join the adapter together with the amino acid. Crick's prediction was later confirmed with the discovery of yet another kind of RNA called transfer RNA. These carry an amino acid on one side and a three-letter sequence of RNA bases on the other called an anticodon, which seeks out its corresponding codon on messenger RNA through the base pairing rules. 
Sure enough, there were different adapters and enzymes for each of the 20 amino acids.